Yeah, that'll wake you up. Hey, welcome back to the shop and my channel. I mentioned in past videos that I used to build boats, and I mentioned in the last video that I used to build tools, or tried to be a tool builder. And the tools that I built back in the day were caulking mallets and little tiny bevel gauges. Boat builders like little tiny bevel gauges. Um, this is not a treatise on how to caulk a boat. This is just how I built these. Um, a little background, um, I started sailing at age six on Casco Bay, Maine in turnabouts and in lightnings, sailed off and on the rest of my life, 1986. I walked aboard this schooner, Schooner Alexandria, ex Lindu, ex Ingve, signed on as, a, as crew and docent. It was a nonprofit foundation. They had a boat school, boat shop. I started working at the boat shop as well, transitioned my woodworking skills into boat building, and eventually wound up teaching boat building to kids at risk, which is a program that exists today, link in the description. And I became the ship's carpenter and bosun mate on the schooner. In 1996, the foundation sold the schooner and the new owner sank it off Cape Hatteras. That's a story for another time. So caulking. Yeah, I, this is one of the things I love about boat building. I love caulking boats and I love lofting. Those are the two big ones. Um, in fact, this is a picture of me caulking a seam on the USS Constitution during her 1994 refit, 93, 94 refit. The yard manager and the master caulker were friends of mine. That's why I was able to get down into the, into the uh, dry dock. And the ship's carpenter, excuse me, the ship's master caulker goes, show me what you got, kid. Those caulking irons are that long. My caulking irons are this long. And this, by the way, is one of my prized possessions. This is a new old stock Sea Drew caulking iron, double lot, so it's very thin. More on Sea Drew right now. So when I started making knees, I did the research and found that Cedru made some of the best caulking mallets in the market. Nothing was available back then. Nobody was making these, so I had to make my own. The ones that were for sale were hideously expensive. The head is live oak. The handle is cherry. The rings are DOM 4130 chromoly steel. It's a very machinable, very rugged material, and since it's DOM or drawn over mandrel, there's no seams. One of the trademarks of the Drew mallets was the face, face rings were tapered, like so. So I did the same thing. I tapered mine. I had access to a machine shop at the time, and I take a piece cut to length like this, and I machine it along its length, so you see it's thicker there and thinner there, and I put a bevel inside here so to make it easier to slide onto the mallet. And the same with the inner ring, I put a bevel on the inside. Make it slide down on the on the uh, on the mallet easier. So, turned on the lathe. Obviously, this is my very first one. It's the one that I've been using forever. It's kind of rough because I was just learning, but it works and it works very well. Um, so, what do you do? Is you turn the head and the handle. Put the handle aside. Press the rings on the head. And the way I did that was I have a jig. And I place the, cent the inner ring on the jig and put this into a hydraulic press and press it down in place. To do the head ring, the end ring, I did the same thing. I made a little jig. The, 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 the head ring fits right in there. And again, put it in a hydraulic press and press it down in place. The reason you do that first before cutting the slots, which I'm going to talk about, is if you have the slots cut in place when you do that, you have a chance of blowing it out. Now, once that's done, I would... Uh, cut the slots. In this case, these are cut by hand with a keyhole saw. That was rather tedious and kind of messy. I'll show you a better technique in a minute. So I'd cut the slots in it and there's one on each side end. And it's been said that those dampen vibration and you can tune the tone of the mallet by changing the length of the slots. That's the tone of the mallet. Live oak is a very dense wood. It's a very dense, hard, tight grained, very dense wood, uh, specific, specific gravity, like close to one. Um, this form factor has evolved over hundreds of years, and it's basically reached its pinnacle. This is a one-use tool. It's a munitasker. It's for caulking, and it does that very, very well. As to improving the slots, I had access to a machine shop. After the rings were in place, I would chuck this up into, with the grain going the right way, into a um, 
the uh, vise on the milling machine, and I have a sl slitting saw, and I'd cut this side of the slot, and then pick it up, move it over, come back down, cut this side of the slot. Actually, no, I cut this side of the slot, move it over like this, and cut this side of the slot so they all lined up. Of course, that would leave a circle here on the inside, semicircle, from the radius of the saw. And then I went in with the keyhole saw again and just cleaned that part out. This one's made of live, excuse me, this one's made of black mesquite. It has a good ring, not quite as good as the live oak. Um, so that's how I built my mallets. Now, um, in the description, I've linked a video to the Caulking of Tally Ho, Samson Boat Company's website, uh, YouTube channel. That video is fairly long, but it gives you a full rundown and description of the tools you, they use that you're using caulking a boat, the materials you use to caulk a boat, the mallets you use, how you use the mallets, and why they're designed this way, and why they're so, they're, they're so effective. So I, I, I highly recommend you look at that video. But in the interim, Leo, Samson Boat Company, gave me permission to take snippets out of that video and include it in this video. So take a look at the following segments of the crew of Tally Ho caulking the seams on that glorious vessel. Hope you enjoyed that. You'll note when they were caulking the boat, they were drawing up cotton into a loop and then pounding it and then come back and making that into the boat. <clears throat> On the East Coast, we call that gagging. You gag the cotton up and get it in place, and then you come back with the, with the, with the irons and you pound it deeply in, in place, deeper and deeper and deeper, until you get that change in sound I was talking about to let you know that the fiber is in where it needs to be and as deep and as tight as it needs to be. As to uh, caulking the boat itself, why we do it that way, it's not to keep the water out. That's just fiber. If you pour water on that, it's going to leak through the fiber. What this does is tighten one plank against the other, against the next, against the next. Turns the boat into basically a monocoque construction. We used to have a little saying in the boat shop when we were building small boats, is when you caulk the boat up and it's finished, you'd ring the bell. Ring the boat. You go up and hit it with your fist and it would kind of ring like a bell. As Leo states in the video, the more of the boat gets caulked, the more the boat, the sound of the caulking of the boat changes because it's getting tighter. What goes on top of the fiber is a seam compound. That seam compound is what keeps the water out. So let's go on to the bevel gauge next. The bevel gauge. So this is a bevel gauge. Every, every woodworking shop, most carpenters have these. It, you know, different angles, different lengths, it kind of gets around like that. These are great for larger projects, but for building small boats, there's a lot of small, little intricate angles you need to get into and take measurements off of. So what's really, what, what boat builders really love are these. This is a little brass bevel gauge. And oh, it's simple to make, kind of simple in execution, but this had a lot of steps to make it. Uh, like I said, it's brass. The body of it is a piece of one half inch by three sixteenths brass bar stock. The blade is a piece of one sixteenth by half inch brass bar stock. It's screwed together with a barrel bolt. I don't know if this, come on, get, there we go. It's screwed together with a barrel bolt, bolt or barrel nut. If I had it to do over again, I would uh, flush rivet this. But this, this works out just fine. Uh, let's go, let's come in a little closer and I'll show you some of the details. The way I made these was I took the bar stock, the, uh, this uh, 316 by half inch bar stock, 
and I would chuck it up in the milling machine. I had a jig for that. And I'd take the slicer, which is the 16th inch, and they cut a 16th inch slot into the bar stock. And you can see it, it ends here on the top, it ends here on the bottom, because that's a radius. So that makes room for that little that bevel at the end. So I, I go and machine a bunch of these up, and then the, uh, there would be this much left on it, and it would be still connected at both ends. Before cutting off the end here, so I can put this, bevel, this turning piece on, is I put these in the oven at 350 degrees for half an hour. That strain relieves them, because if you just cut that end off, they pop open like that. If you don't cut those on, end up, they, make, they stay nice and parallel right here. The blade is really simple. I just cut a 45 here. And um, I put the whole thing together with a snug-fitting uh, barrel bolt, which is the barrel goes in here, the screw goes in here, and I've got some plastic like capped on in there as a, as a, as a little bit of a um, uh, friction reliever. So that goes together, and now what I have when I'm dead at that point is I've got a double square, square at both ends. Add another jig where I would stick the blade and the body in through that hole and rotate it up against a milling head and round, move it in slowly with the vise, and I would round that head off until I have the round circle, round, uh, rounded end right here. So that's what I meant. There's a lot of steps in making these. And if I said, like I said, if I had it to do again, I would use um, probably soft brass, soft copper, or soft brass uh, rivets, uh, homemade rivets. I would bevel the metal on this on either side, put the rivet in there and tap it down till it mushrooms out, then grind it down smooth, and it would look like, it just look like one solid piece. So why the little tiny, I, th I mentioned, kind of alluded to it earlier, but why the tiny little bevel gauge? The simple answer is, when you're dealing with small boats, 17, 20, 15 foot, there's a lot of places, really tight little places, you've got to take an angle off and then transfer that to a piece of stock that's going in there. You take that angle off in two places because it's going to be a compound angle. Angle this way and an angle that way. This is where these come in really handy uh, because they're small and easy to, 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 to get into tight pace places and they fit right in your right in your apron right there. So that's my bubble gauges. I made tons of these and sold them. I think I sold them for $15 a piece. I don't know what they go for now. I think there's a couple of people, couple of people making them again. Um, but like I said, I moved on to other things and other careers and stuff. So those are the tools that I made when I was building boats and when I was maintaining the schooner Alexandria. Um, please watch Leo's video in, in the description get a really good feel for what's going on, learn about the tools, and learn about his crazy crew. It's a great bunch of people. I wish I was in Port Townsend right now working on Tally Ho, but uh, I'm all the way across the country, and I'm retired. So anyway, um, that's it for now. Make great things out of wood. Make a couple of tools if you need them. <laughs>